My name is Lakai Sharma. I'm a BMP coordinator uh, and assistant professor in soil and water sciences department uh, and soil fertility uh, specialist by training. Um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the co-organizer with the, of this BMP summit with the, uh, Dr. Michael Dukes and uh, Emily Eubanks. Uh, thank you both of you for helping me in developing this uh, BMP summit. We have two speakers today, um, Carol Estes, and Carol is a manager farms program at Southwest Florida Water Management District. Uh, Carol will be our first speaker and our second speaker is Dr. Charles Barrett, Extension Regional Specialized Agent Water Resources. Um, with that, I would say, uh, Carol, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share screens. And that one. And oh. hang on. There we go. And We go. You guys see my slide? Yep. Okay, and I'll get started. Good afternoon. I'm Carol Estes, as he said, manager of the Southwest Florida Water Management District Farms Program. And just as some background, um, I've been with the program since 2004. And before that, I did environmental consulting in Lakeland, Florida and in Arizona. And I'm a professional geologist. So the topic today is agricultural water collection and reuse systems. And we'll discuss that, but first I need to bring you all up to speed on how we got involved in encouraging the use of these systems and maybe some background on where they might be appropriate and where they might not be. So I work in a program called FARMS, and because everyone needs a nifty little acronym, we came up with this one for our program, which is Facilitating Agricultural Resource Management Systems, or FARMS. So this is our standard slide that explains what FARMS is and does. It's a best management practice cost share reimbursement program for agricultural projects. It was created in 2003 in partnership with FDAX, and our goals are primarily to reduce groundwater use, but we also want to improve water quality that was impacted by mineralized groundwater, improve natural systems functions in wetlands and in other watersheds. And also very recently, we've been tasked with trying to make nutrient management improvements in the district. Two, the types of projects we typically do are alternative water supplies or our reservoir projects, and then conservation, which would be automated pump, automated valve controls, soil moisture sensors, weather stations, that sort of thing. And like I said, we just, we've recently been allowed to begin to fund uh, systems that retain or reduce nutrient loading. So we got our start in the Shell Prairie and Joshua Creek SPJC watershed. And that's the pastel region that you see down in this in the southern part of the district. After the city of, we got the start after the city of Punta Gorda's reservoir water quality exceeded secondary drinking water standards for chlorides. They were listed as an impaired watershed, but the district helped develop a remedial action plan in lieu of FDP establishing TMDLs for the watersheds and farms was one of those remedial actions. So why did this watershed have excess chlorides? As you go further south in the state, salt water intruding from the coasts gets shallower. So in Polk County, you probably won't get high chlorides in wells that are drilled 12 to 1400 feet deep. But as you go down to Charlotte County, you might. There was a period of time when agricultural wells was drilled a little bit deeper to try and access a particularly productive section of the Florida, Florida aquifer. And this resulted in agricultural wells pumping groundwater with higher chloride content. Then the runoff from these wells 
was thought to contribute to the excess chlorides found in Shell Creek. So SWIFTMUD developed a program to help backplug the wells with high chlorides where we sealed off that, that higher productivity section, but the section of the, of the casing that were of the well that um, had the high chlorides. And we also helped fund reservoirs to capture runoff and reduce groundwater use. And it was a success. Growers loved it. Uh, it was really well liked in this area. Um, it reduced chloride content running off into the creeks. It reduced growing grower pumping costs it, since it's cheaper to pump from the surface than from 1400 feet down. They generally had better water quality to irrigate with, with lower chloride content, and it reduced groundwater use in the area. So Swift and Swift Mud provided the funding to make it a reasonable alternative to other irrigation water sources. So a major resource concern in the Southern Water Use Caution Area, which is our district, everything pretty much south of I-4, was an over-reliance on groundwater. And since the program worked so well in the SPJC, the district expanded it first to the Swaka and then to the higher, the entire district. So that's our origin story. Here's an example of the benefits of using a reservoir in the Shell Prairie Joshua Creek watershed. This is the same tree. And in 2003, the grower was irrigating with groundwater wells that were drilled to a depth of about 1400 feet. By 2009, most of his irrigation water was coming from reservoirs, and he eventually dug three reservoirs and put five pumping stations on those reservoirs. And you can see that the tree is much healthier in 2009 than it was in 2003. So features of the farms program include, include the, that growers define the projects. They choose the BMPs that they think they can implement, and then we work with them to develop that project. The project has to reduce permittable groundwater use. It has to meet a cost benefit benchmark, which is a cost per thousand gallon saved. These generally range from a dollar to three dollars per thousand gallon saved over a five year term. This is so that the district doesn't pay a million dollars to save 10,000 gallons per day of groundwater. Um, they need to sign a contract between the grower and the district and commit to five to 10 years of implementing that BMP and using the equipment that we fund. And the grower must pay at least 25% of the total project costs. So far, we have 220 projects approved, of which 161 are reservoir projects, which is about 73% of our, of our projects. 129 of those are in the Southern Water Use Caution Area, like I said, roughly south of I-4, and 65 of them are in the Shell Prairie Joshua Creek. And we'll get back to that in a moment about why that is. The reduction in groundwater use that we get from agricultural reservoirs averages about 142,000 gallons per day. And most of our projects are between two and three acres each, and that's per project, 142,000 gallons per day per project on average. And we reduce groundwater use by about 23 million gallons a day from all of our reservoir projects. Over the years, we needed to get a handle on what any particular reservoir could produce on a regular basis, so we could estimate the benefit to the district for the project. So 10 years ago, we looked at the average size of our reservoirs and what they produced and came up with an entirely empirical rule of thumb estimate. We revised this estimate a couple of years ago and came to almost the same conclusion. With the most recent estimate, we looked at 106 reservoirs. We threw out the very large reservoirs that we have. We have some that are over 100 acres. Those are generally naturally occurring uh, reservoirs or lakes or they're old burrow pits or shell pits. And we threw out the very small reservoirs, those with generally less than a, an acre. We also based this estimate on what a grower uses out of the reservoir rather than what the reservoir might actually yield uh, capacity wise. And since we're, es since we're estimating that ground using the reservoir is, is key to our cost benefit, it might actually have the capacity to produce 100,000 gallons per day but if the grower only needs 45,000 gallons per day, we don't wanna overestimate the potential groundwater use reduction. 
And these estimates are not volume-based, both but both times we arrived at an estimate of about 30 to 40,000 gallons per day per acre of reservoir. And we generally estimate the reservoirs are about 12 feet deep. But as I said, it's really just the acreage of the reservoir over the, um, versus the amount that's, that reservoir is being used. So where and when do our, do agricultural reservoirs make sense? Location is key. In our district, primary areas for reservoirs is south of I-4 and west of Highway 27, which is sort of the southwestern portion of our district. You go much to the north, it starts to get too karstic, but we've done some reservoirs to the north of I-4, but not very many. And to the east, we have large sand ridges of the Lakeland and Lake Wales Ridge and any excess water in these sand ridge areas doesn't run off, it just is absorbed by the very sugary sand found, by, found in the area. Also farms to the north and the east tend to be smaller farms and, that, and a farm has to have sufficient permitted quantity of groundwater to support the cost of the reservoir project, which can be between two and $300,000. Further, for a grower to commit to using a reservoir, it has to make some economic sense for him or her. Um, in Shell Prairie Joshua Creek, the obvious incentive was they got better quality water to irrigate with. For other growers, it's the pumping costs. And for other growers still, it might be a lower pH found in reservoirs than in the area's groundwater. Another benefit to the environment is the nutrient retention potential of agricultural reservoirs. Until recently, we were only able to fund nutrient retention projects in the spring sheds. But last year, the governing board allowed us to start opening up the program to fund nutrient retention and reduction projects district-wide. Why? They also had to provide the ability to reduce groundwater to use in addition to the nutrient benefit. We were still keeping that constraint. We knew about the tools used to estimate nitrogen retention in stormwater ponds, so we decided to take a shot at estimating the nutrient benefits of agricultural reservoirs. Patrick Terra of Interra did these calculations for us, and we haven't thoroughly vetted them yet, but it makes sense that there is some nitrogen retention benefit to these reservoirs. And again, this is very, very preliminary data. We, we forwarded them 93 farm, farms funded reservoirs, and the the specifications of those ponds, the size of the pond. They could then calculate the size of the watershed and um, we provided the location so they could determine the soil types and a lot of the other information variables that go into the model. He used the BMP trains model, which is developed, was developed by UCF. And this model is also used to estimate stormwater pond nutrient retention benefits. And what, they found, what he found was that on the average, agricultural reservoirs could retain about 60% of the annual nitrogen loads um, that would be retained or withdrawn for irrigation. So how do we know the reservoirs work to reduce groundwater use? Well, every project that we do must meter their groundwater and their reservoir water use. Each project is tracked monthly to check estimated groundwater quantities reduced. We have 199 operational projects with an actual cumulative offset of 26.6 million gallons a day that we're reducing groundwater use within our district. And overall farms accomplishments, we've had 220 board approved projects with estimated offsets of 29.87 million gallons a day. Our total, total project costs have been around 77 million since 2003 with the district portion equaling 43.7 million. And that breaks down to about 56 to 44% district to farmer ratio. And our projects have worked out to about $2 and nine cents per thousand gallons saved, which is significantly less than, um, than public supply cooperative funding projects. So it's a very cost-effective way to reduce groundwater use. And so far we've been budgeted 6 million each year since 2010, I think. And so we still have money to, to fund the projects. 
And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Suzanne Archer. She's in the St. John's River Water Management District, and she's going to talk about their agricultural water collection and reuse systems. Thank you, Carol. Uh-huh. Yeah, good afternoon. I've been with St. John's for going on eight years. My background is actually horticulture. I started my career in the greenhouse business in Apopka, first with bedding plants and then tissue culture and foliage. Next slide, Carol. So the St. John's River Water Management District has had a dedicated agricultural cost share program since 2015. There's an annual budget of $3 million, which is divided between the Tri-County Agricultural Area of Putnam, Flagler, and St. John's counties, and then the district-wide, which is the remaining 15 counties covered by our district. There's an annual cap of $250,000 with funding up to 75% for projects that can serve water, make water uh, available through alternative water sources, or reduce off-site nutrient loading. Next slide. Alternative water supply and agricultural water reu reuse are much less common in St. John's compared to swift mud. Um, one of the common concerns that we hear from the growers, especially vegetable growers, is from a food safety standpoint, and not even so much FSMA, but their buyers are demanding that they use groundwater. We've had 189 projects funded to date, and only 10 of them have been agricultural water reuse projects, but there have been a few fun projects a little outside of the normal tailwater pond shown here um, that I'll highlight. Out of those 189 projects, 120 of them have been for water conservation and account for an estimated 10.67 million gallons per day in water savings. You can see, though, that those alternative water supply projects, which are only 5% of the total, account for 12% of the estimated water savings. However, I do want to note, since Carol was talking quite a bit about costs per kgal or 1,000 gallons, that uh, some of the projects that I am going to highlight, while they've been certainly beneficial, um, they are a little bit more expensive than our typical water conservation or pond construction type of project. Next slide. A popular water conservation project in our district, uh, particularly in the Tri-County agricultural area, is conversion from seepage irrigation to sub-irrigation drain tile. This is different from the open tile drain systems of the Midwest in that control structures allow the grower to either irrigate or drain by placing boards in the structures and turning on the pumps to fill or turning off the pumps and pulling the boards to drain during heavy rain events. In this particular case, a grower in Brevard County incorporated the irrigation drain tile with tailwater capture and recovery. He didn't even uh, construct ponds. He just had large canals that um, ran along one side of his sod fields. According to FDAC's mobile irrigation lab evaluations, the system went from 67% efficiency to 96% efficiency by doing both practices. And so there was an estimated savings of 109 gallon, million gallons per year on the 237 acres. Next slide. AgriStarts in Apopka is a tissue culture lab and 210,000 square foot greenhouse facility that grows foliage along with food crops such as blueberries and blackberries. They added two 250,000 gallon cisterns several years ago that capture rainwater off of the roof line of the greenhouses, as you can see in that um, picture on the upper left. Four inches of rainfall will fill the tanks and last them approximately 45 days. The water is used primarily for the evaporative cooling pads, but also for the irrigation. Inside of the greenhouses, the benches are ebb and flood. The water is collected in the troughs that you see on the bottom left hand picture. They're filtered, treated, and fertilizer levels are adjusted. No water or fertilizer hits the ground, and the nursery supplies five acres of greenhouses with just one four inch well. There are at least two other greenhouses in Apopka that I'm aware of that have similar rainwater collection practices, and there could very well be more, and I just don't know about them. These greenhouses are within the Central Florida Water Initiative water supply area where groundwater withdrawals from the aquifer are reaching sustainable limits and we certainly applaud their efforts. AgriSarts received funding and technical assistance from both NRCS and also St. John's. Next slide. 
In another example, Traders Hill Farm in Nassau County operates an aquaponics production system out of converted chicken barns. They were already efficient as the water from the fish production was used to produce hydroponic vegetables. They wanted to be even more efficient and replace the water loss to evaporation and evapotranspiration by collecting water off the greenhouse roof. And we helped them do that with cost share in 2015 to construct rainwater harvesting and to fund a pump to add water back to the system when needed. Next slide. Loops Greenhouse in Duval County has been in existence since 1959. They wanted to conserve water without the expense of completely retrofitting their entire greenhouses and converting to ebb and flood benches. So they purchased metal troughs, as you see in that top picture, and laid them right on top of the expanded metal benches. And then, of course, the containers go on top. And you can see where the irrigation comes out at the beginning of the, um, the rows to fill the troughs. This way they're able to capture all of the water and fertilizer, filter it as seen in the picture on the right, treat it and adjust the EC for the next irrigation cycle. According to the Mobile Irrigation Lab audit, each table had been receiving 115 gallons of water with 70 gallons of that hitting the ground and lost. Because they had overhead irrigation and high value container crops, you know, which obviously the spot pots are spaced out, they were irrigating not just the pots, but the spaces in between. With this retrofit, water and fertilizer no longer hit the ground. We've also done a few tailwater pond construction projects, but I just wanted to hit on a few of the, the more innovative or out of the box methods of agricultural water capture and reuse. And Carol and I will be happy to take questions uh, at the end after Dr. Barrett is done. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we have a sign-in sheet for CCA credits. If anybody's interested, there will be a QR code uh, in the sign-in sheet. You can use that, or we will also publish the QR code at the end of the session. Uh, all right, I don't see any questions. So I would invite our next speaker, Dr. Charles Perry. Uh, Dr. Chosper is in uh, Live Oak uh, and a regional specialist agent, and I would say he's the soil moisture sensor specialist uh, that I, I have worked with ever. The best guy to ask questions for soil moisture sensors. Charles, the floor is yours. Thanks, Lakesh. No pressure, huh? <laughs> um, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get going. And then I guess there'll be time for questions at the end. So bear with me. All right. Is that looking correct? Can anybody give me a perfect? Awesome. So if you've heard me talk about soil moisture sensors once, you've heard me a thousand times. This probably won't be amazingly different, but I saw a lot of names in the online on the group, uh, on the participants list that I haven't seen before. So hopefully I'm reaching some new folks. And if you've heard this before, uh, maybe you'll pick up something new. So what I wanted to start off with today is kind of just, I feel like I cut this type of information out of some of my older presentations before. And I felt the need to put it back in uh, recently after some conversations. But I think the main point I'm trying to drive home with this type of slide is you know, there's a lot going on. But if we focus on this left side where I have the title water relations is to understand how water is moving through a plant. And it's a difference you know, without going too deep into this, it's a difference in pressure. Um, we've got this low pressure here and much lower pressure here that's driving this system this way. If we look at soil water, um, soil water holding capacity, when we're at field capacity and the soil is all the way up, filled up, uh, so 
say that the water holding capacity is at 100%, that's our field capacity, the pressure down on the soil level, the negative pressure, the vacuum that the soil has on that water is zero. And that, that vacuum gets stronger and stronger, the drier the soil gets. So if a plant's gonna take up moisture, it has to overcome the pressure in the soil because the soil's trying to hold on to water and the plant's trying to extract water. And it gets to a point where when we reach permanent wilting point um, where the plant cannot extract any more water uh, from the soil, the soil's holding on to the water more tightly than the, than the, than the plant can extract water. Um, just to, I don't know if that was even helpful, but this is just kind of how I'm trying to think of things. You know, the plant's losing a lot of water for this transpiration stream and it's doing it by this gradient in pressures. So that's why irrigation is necessary in Florida. That's why we have to um, irrigate in most of our soils to, to keep a crop is because our soils don't hold a lot of water and we'll, we'll lose that water quickly and the soil will become so dry that the plants can't take any more water out of the soil. All right, I beat that up, but this is what I like to talk about. So once we, we have it in our mind that the plant's taking water out of the soil, how can we visualize that with a graph? So these soil moisture sensors that I, I use throughout the state are capacitance type sensors. I've also used TDR uh, type sensors. Um, I'm not talking about tension-based sensors. The last page, this last slide, I'm talking about tension here. This is the measure of, of um, tension in the soil and tension in the plant. I'm not talking about that here. Here I'm flipping it over into things that normal people, us normal people understand, which is if I have an increase in moisture, the line goes up. If I have a decrease in moisture, the line goes down. And that, to me, that makes much more sense. And this is the level that I think at. Um, so what happens? on these lines is this black line is at four inches, this red line's at eight, 12, and 16. So if you can follow these lines down, they're going deeper and deeper in the soil profile. During the day where we have root activity, we'll see water uptake look like this. Um, this is a decrease in moisture. This is water being taken up by the plant. Something else to point out, and I think everybody can see my mouse when I wiggle my mouse around, is the gradual curve here. When we change from this slope to this slope, there's a curve here. And then we change again right in here from this downward slope during the day to this flatter slope at night. That change is the sunrise coming up. So the intensity of the sun, we start off very light in the morning with, a, with daybreak and then it gets intense um, and there's a maximum amount of water uptake that we're gonna see. And so what we're seeing here is the sunrise and the sunset on the graph at night. It's more or less a flat line. During the day, we start taking up water again at night, flat lines again. And so if we can start to see this pattern, this is a real basic lesson in soil moisture sensor um, data interpretation, if we can see this day-night pattern, we can start to piece together what's going on out in the field. Um, another thing to point out is this increase in moisture. When we see this spike on the lines, um, we can see how deep the moisture went. And in time, we can measure how much time it took for it to get to four inches, from four inches to eight inches. Um, and on this irrigation event or this rainfall event, maybe we had a quick little shower and then boom, we had a, we had a more intense rainfall, um, but it was short lived. And so the water only went down to eight inches and you can just barely see a tiny little bit of an increase down here at 12 inches. So maybe the water stopped really somewhere more like at, at 10 inches, but we don't have a sensor at 10 inches. 
Um, with this vendor, this soil moisture sensor also has a summary line. This line down here at the bottom is a sum of, of the lines up here on the top. And so from that, we can measure root water uptake, the total amount of water that was taken up from one day, and then we can measure it for the second day. And by comparing these two days, if the weather was the same, we could say, oh, okay, um, on this second day, we took up less water than we did on the first day. What's going on? Was there less water there? Maybe we need to start thinking about irrigating. Or it could just be that this second day was cloudy and this day was sunny. And so we took up less water on the cloudy day, which makes perfect sense. So there's a lot of information already that we were talking about just on this simple slide. We know how deep an irrigation or a rainfall event went. We can see where our active root zone is. We can quantify how much water is being taken up by the plant. So we went from a, a more simple representation of data to a more in-depth representation of data, but the, the data are the same. Uh, we see here A, this is a rainfall event. We see a big, strong, uh, quick infiltration event. Uh, water went from four to eight to 12 to 16 inches rapidly. And this rainfall event went deeper and deeper, um, which I'll show on a deeper, on, a, on another slide further in the presentation. But you can compare this rainfall, this big heavy rainfall event to this more shallow irrigation event uh, where we only irrigated down to eight inches, this eight inch line. So what am I looking for here is, um, did I irrigate to where my root zone is or not? Did I not irrigate so far past my root zone? I'm comfortable with this irrigation event going down to eight inches because I can just barely start seeing a little wiggle in these lines. Um, that's telling me that my roots are clearly here at four inches, but maybe they're somewhere in here at six inches because I'm having an influence on the moisture at eight inches. Here, I can clearly see root activity at eight inches. I can see it here clearly at 12 and clear at 16 here. And at, over time, as this crop grew, the roots went deeper and deeper. So this is something that we are able to see with these soil moisture sensors that we wouldn't be able to see without destructively harvesting a plant and digging up and seeing how deep the roots were. So this gives us our eyes in the soil type deal. It looks a lot more intense, I think, at first when you see all these lines. But I think my advice to folks is to stop and pick it apart. Just be patient. If, you, if you're looking at these lines, there's most of these vendors online, you can manipulate the graph to um, to expand the field of view so you can see many more days. You can maybe adjust it to a month range and then go down to a day range. Um, and if you play with these different views, you can see different things. So that's my suggestion. Or you can, sometimes you can turn off and on these lines. This vendor here is AquaSpy. You can turn these lines off. So I have all the rest of them turned off. I just have the top four lines turned on to where you can kind of pick them apart. <clears throat> this is that same AquaSpy graph, but you can see where these deep rainfall events make it down, some of them almost down or past 48 inches, like down here at the end where we had a lot of rainfall and in the middle of May this year, not this year, 2021, but the year on this slide. Uh, and so you can see how all this rainfall stacked up and eventually, you know, here in the beginning, we're getting some rain. It's not really going that deep because our soil was more or less dry. Um, and then as more and more rainfall events added up, you can see, boom, it, it reaches this tipping point where we had enough rain and we filled up enough of this, this, these soil layers that we just started pushing water down past 48 inches. And this is, I mean, past 48 inches, your crop roots aren't really doing a whole heck of a lot um, in, in most crops. And so, um, that's water that's lost and that's potential nutrients that's lost. I would say that most of our crop roots are going to be somewhere, you know, most vegetable crops somewhere around, you know, down to 12 inches uh, that are really doing work. Um, you can get into some of these agronomic crops like corn 
where you can get down to two feet where I feel comfortable at two feet saying, you know, you're doing some work at two feet, but still, regardless of any crop, 90% of the work is being done in the top 12 inches. Um, this was a watermelon plant where the drip tape came disconnected on the line on the, in the bed that I had the soil moisture sensor installed. So we got to see what happens when a watermelon plant goes into deep uh, drought stress. And so it will apparently put roots all the way down to 48 inches on a watermelon crop. And that's, that's not a good look for your watermelon crop, I promise. So another feature on this uh, site that I don't always point out is this spread right here. This vendor has the option to where you can spread these lines out. The spread is in reference to these lines. So if I clicked on this and went down to zero, all these lines would be on the same y-axis. But by spreading this out, I can, I can see more clearly these lines because there's more separation between them. And so that kind of makes things easier to digest. And this is kind of what I was talking about with the rain, but I forgot I had animated that slide. So I'm gonna go here. <laughs> Um, so here kind of what happened is kind of like what we saw in the last one, uh, just with a different vendor here, we see what happens between irrigation events and this, um, this farmer irrigated here and then was waiting for the rain and the rain finally came here right on the end, but I wanted to show kind of this progression of drought stress and to show why plants, I mean, I guess I, I try to personalize plants maybe a little bit too much as somebody with a PhD should do, but uh, I like to think of them more or less as, as people and they're smart. They're smart people, these plants. Um, what they do is they take up the easy water first. That's what this graph is highlighting. So we irrigated. And we see root stair steps up here at four inches. So we're taking up water, but we're, you see how we're taking up less and less water as time goes on. And that's because there's less and less water there to take up. So what happens next? Well, I dive down to eight inches and I'm going to pull the next easiest water to take up. So it starts pulling up water there. And later on, it was like we depleted the water from four and eight inches. So Let's try getting some water down here at 12 inches. Well, take up the water there at 12 inches, we flatlined. And you see how these lines become real flat. There's no more water uptake happening there. So then we start pulling down here at uh, 16 inches. And so you see how that progression over time, what happens if you don't irrigate a crop, they'll dive down deeper, deeper, and you'll encourage root growth. And this is kind of that concept of prime acclimation that you hear about sometimes in cotton. Uh, where or or other crops where you can kind of pre-drought stress uh, acclimate crops by giving them a shot of water early on, letting them start to develop a root system, and then pulling out the rug from them while they're still vegetative. Let them build a big root system so that later on in the season they have a big root system. Especially that's good for when you're putting on a fruit crop or something, something like peppers or tomatoes. Um, so that's that. And then I'm going to try to not dwell on this too much, but I know we got a lot of visitors from other areas of the state and all the, all the examples up until this example have been in well-drained soils, deep sandy soils. Um, but these, this graph here is from a seepage irrigated system over in St. John's Water Management District, but it could be in South Florida anywhere where we have seepage. And what you see, what I'm trying to show is this is, this is just a graph with all the lines on the same y-axis like you would make in Excel. And there's, the lines are not spread at all. This is just how the cookie crumbled here. And what you see early on, well, I highlighted all my rainfall events. You can see all these spikes where we had irrigation or rainfall. Well, this is all rain because this is seep irrigated. So, um, but you see early on here where I had drier soil and I got some rain, it acted as overhead irrigation. So I see a, an increase in moisture and then I see my typical stair step pattern, right? Water being applied from above. I see this stair step pattern right in here if you're following along with my mouse. 
Okay, what happens in this area is what I want to show to all my seepage irrigation folks is this is what water uptake looks like from below when we're supplying water from below. And so what happens is this goes back to that very first slide. We deplete the moisture at the top of that soil profile. So our pressure gets more negative up there. That means the vacuum force gets stronger at the top of our soil profile. So that's up in here. Uh, well, you'll have to bear with me, but it's at the top of the soil profile. So if I extract water from the top of the soil profile and I make that vacuum stronger there, then water from below where I have where I'm at field capacity or more, I'm saturated in a seepage situation, that water will go up into that, where that negative pressure is to reestablish equilibrium. So this is what we see here. We're seeing water being extracted uh, and it's, it's more clear to see on this green line. So if I can orient you all for one second, which I should have done first, this orange line, this bottom line down here is at four, uh, four inches. This green line is at eight. This light blue line is at 12, then 16 and 18. And there's some more lines that are turned off. Uh, but if, if you see this, I'm, I'm drinking some water up during the day and then at night, you see this hump where water comes back in from below. It's real obvious here at eight inches. I, it looks like as time went on, this seepage irrigation, they, they raised the boards and they lifted the water up. So you see this blue line at 12 inches come up actually over time. And the crop is, is pulling water up and the irrigation water, the water level in the field, the water table is coming up. And so you can see the, in general, this line comes up and then it flatlines and then it's kind of stable. This is, this is just sipping water, taking up as much water as it needs throughout the day. Um, it's a, from a crop production standpoint, seepage irrigation, you can do a really good job of, of supplying adequate moisture. Uh, it just takes a lot of water to seep irrigate a field. Um, and I won't belabor that point, but this is what it looks like. I, I always think this is super interesting to see. You can see it's happening at all depths. You see this thing, this little wavy, I don't know how else to describe it. It's a wavy line but that's what it looks like. That's water coming from below. This is a crop, this crop didn't die. This crop was very healthy, uh, but this is what it's supposed to look like on seepage irrigation. So it's a different picture, I guess that's my summary, than, than what you see over here, where you see the stair steps and it's super clear and you can see the moisture train going down over time and then it's replaced and then blah, blah, blah. So uh, I'll move on from here and hopefully we'll get some questions on this later on. But it's very interesting to me, and I hope more people can learn to see this because seepage irrigation does cover a lot of the state. I'll leave everybody with a success story. Um, this is kind of a, a phone call that I got, and it goes back to what I'm trying to tell y'all. It, it can look like wavy lines at first, but really, if you start to pick it apart, what do you notice? You notice here we have two irrigation events a day versus here when we when the phone call happened, we switched the, the farmer over to doing three irrigation events a day um, for a shorter duration. Here with the two irrigation events, the, the run times were too long and you're seeing a lot of moisture get down to this bottom line. Here uh, where we're doing three shorter irrigation events, you see much less water get to that bottom line. And what happened was they were getting behind here and here they were maintaining. So we were more or less putting the water back that the crop was using each day here. If we had seen a trend going upwards, we would have been getting ahead. We would have been applying too much water. Uh, but here we were maintaining what, what the crop needed. Uh, so that's what we were able to do. We were able to save um, a whole hour's worth of irrigation event uh, of irrigation per day. So if you think about a, a large drip system, I think this turned out to be about 7 million gallons of water uh, from, from this farm. 
uh, based on the number of days and the number of hours of irrigation saved. But I mean, we've been able to save on one big corn farm, we were able to save 200 million gallons of water over the course of a season. And we did that two seasons in a row so far. And so, and that's been backed up by the Swanee River Water Management District. They have metering uh, data on those, those pumps. So we're able to save a lot of water with these soil moisture sensors just by managing the water, putting back what the crop uses and not more and not less. So with that, I think we're probably good to go for some questions. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Carol, for your uh, awesome presentations. Uh, we have some question answers going on, some chats going on in the chat uh, box. Um, there's no question left. I think there was a question for Michael Dukes, and I think Joe, um, Suzanne had already answered that. So, oh, okay. So there is a question. Do we have EDIS publication or can the group recommend a few method papers on use of soil moisture sensor for monitoring soil moisture in pasture systems, applied field trials evaluating pasture BMPs? Charles, do we have a... Uh, publication on on using no i haven't seen anything um evaluating soil moisture sensors and pastures i have used them but i have done zero research on that and i don't know if we're there yet on any of that um there's some work being done out in the panhandle but i don't think we're to a point where there's a edis pub on it either thank you Charles. Uh, folks, we have a survey uh, link available in the chat box. Please use this survey to improve our programming. Uh, <clears throat> the survey also has some uh, questions related to the presenters. If you want to adopt a soil moisture sensor, you can reach out to the concern uh, uh, person directly or you can send me an email and I'll get you in, uh, in touch with the person. Uh, that works on it. Uh, please use this link. Uh, this is less than 60 seconds uh, that will ask you uh, to answer all those survey questions. Uh, we have a QR code for your CCAs uh, if you are interested in your, uh, so, um, applying for the CCA credits. All right, I don't see any question. Uh, I may have a question for Charles. Uh, Charles, how, um, so uh, there are growers that are using uh, fertigation, uh, nitrogen through the, fertig uh, through the irrigation, which we call a fertigation uh, as a source to split uh, their nitrogen application across the crop, crop, crop growth period. Uh, if there is a rain event that goes over 10, 10 days or 15 days, and it's giving enough sufficient moisture for the crop, how those growers can uh, use uh, soil moisture sensors to apply nitrogen. Basically, the, the, the water requirement is already uh, fulfilled, but the nutrient requirement is not, but they have no other way to apply nitrogen. So how, how to address that kind of a situation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and we've, we've seen this a lot, uh, not a lot, but in wet years, you do see this. And the soil moisture sensors are gonna tell you what you kind of already know. It's wet, but I still need to get fertilizer out. So uh, the recommendation there is always, you know, get a, <laughs> turn that pump all the way up, you know, and put that fertilizer out as hot as possible in the shortest amount of irrigation time as possible. Um, because you're not, you don't have to worry about burning your crop because there's adequate moisture already. So um, that's usually, I like, you know, if I digress here a little bit, I'm sorry, but I like to put fertilizer out fast. You know, I'd rather inject fast, either in a pivot or, or um, on drip, especially on drip though. I'd rather pressurize the system, inject as fast as I can, get it into the system as fast as I can to be uniformly distributed and then get it out there, 
and and flush out my system and turn it off so that as much of the fertilizers at the soil surface as possible because every time we get a rainfall event and every time we irrigate we have that potential of pushing it the nutrients further and further in the soil um, but we have got behind on wet years and it's like well we got to put the fertilizer out but it's you know it's not an ideal situation yeah i won't complain this year my finger crossed um all right. So Dr. Dukes also asked me to comment on the cost of the sensors, maintenance, et cetera, and also how many do you need? Um, so the cost, it, you know, if you're going to outright buy a soil moisture sensor unit like we, we're, what we're using, which is a probe, a data logger, and a, and a cell phone subscription, you're going to look at to purchase it somewhere around $2,000. And then there's a cell phone data fee every year. Um, there's a million ways to set it up, but it, you're gonna be somewhere around $2,000 and then a couple hundred bucks each year on the data plan per, per sensor setup. Um, and then the how many do you need on a typical pivot? Um, <laughs> you know, usually the most we'll see on one pivot is one. Um, you put it in the most representative area. This goes for drip or any other seepage, any other farm. Put, get one, start with one, put it in an area that represents the bulk of your fields or the bulk of your irrigated area and, and learn to use the technology and, and figure out um, how to manage what your crop looks like, how to manage you know, to the, to the, based on that one sensor. And then you figure out how many more you want from there. And that's an easy question. After you've looked at these, after you looked at the data long enough and you've figured out how to use them, you'll know where you want to put them and how many more you need and how many you think that you can keep up with. Um, that's my advice on that. You, you want to tell about uh, cost share? There are some cost shares from FDAX, right? Sure. Brands. FDAX and the water management districts up. Uh, so we heard from Southwest Florida, we heard from St. John's already that there's cost share for soil moisture sensors. FDAX does it as well, and, and Swanee River does it. So um, the majority of the state's covered with cost share for soil moisture sensors. Perfect. Uh, all right, we do not have any more questions. All right, so... Um, if you have any additional questions for any of the speakers, please uh, reach out to me uh, or Dr. Dukes or Emily. We will uh, address your questions to the, to the presenters and, and get your answer as soon as we can. Uh, if you have any additional questions for buying uh, uh, soil moisture sensors, uh, please reach out to Charles or me and we can address your uh, questions about that. Um, I think that's probably it. So we have one more session next week left over with Dr. Lincoln's of Rally. And uh, I think uh, the BMP summit will be over after that. Uh, but we have a very successful su um, summit this year, uh, virtual working very good. Um, thank you, um, Charles, Suzanne, and Carol for your presence and, and, and he helping us understand uh, all the concepts about soil moisture sensor and, uh, and, and chlorine, especially there was a there was a good question on chlorine. So uh, um, thank you, Dr. Dukes, for helping us in uh, organizing the summit, and Emily for your uh, help in, um, in getting everything together. Uh, you are the connecting link for everybody. Uh, obviously, all right. So we will see you next week, Tuesday, same time. Thank you. Have a, have a good rest of the day. Thanks. Bye-bye.